Thank you very much. And also hello from my side. Uh, in today's Skills for All sessions, we have uh, Asia and Oceania on the agenda. And uh, I would like to introduce you a little bit into our efforts, the current status, and uh, how we see the future of the Asian develop, uh, Asia and Oceania region from a development perspective. Before we start, I would like to ask you two questions. The first question would be, what is the first thing coming to your mind when you hear about Asia and Oceania? Just for a few seconds, please. And the second question would be, what comes to your mind when you hear about ice hockey in the Asia and Oceania region? Again, just for a few seconds. So first of all, probably many of you were thinking about that Asia uh, itself is relatively big. It is true because it's the largest continent we have. There are billions of people living into the region, or probably some of you were thinking about what is the reason why other sports or entities heavily invest into the Asian and Oceania market, and what is the reason why uh, why there are a lot of sponsors uh, coming to the European market, for example, when we look to soccer. So because of the size uh, of uh, Asia and Oceania, uh, there are also some differences, of course, from a cultural aspect, uh, aspect, uh, perspective, from a uh, geopolitical perspective, economy-wise, but uh, we also know that uh, Asia, uh, that in Asia and Oceania, ice hockey is probably not the number one uh, in the sport industry. And uh, this is basically the starting point of this discussion. And uh, before I go further, I would like to take the opportunity for those who don't know me to introduce myself. Originally, I'm born in Innsbruck in Austria. From uh, 2004 to 2011, I worked in the Austrian Ice Hockey Federation as sport manager, changed then to the IHF, uh, being, res uh, being responsible as a sport development manager for Asia from 2011 to 2015 changed then to the organizing committees of the 2018 and 2022 Olympic Winter Games in Korea and in China. And since last year, um, I am back with the IHF and it is a honor to be again the sport development manager for the Asian and Oceania region. Myself, I'm married to a Chinese, her name is Wang Hui, and uh, we have also a nine-year-old son, his name is Justin or Wang Shaolong. Uh, his favorite sport is actually soccer and uh, he likes to be a goalkeeper. So these are the four areas I would like to discuss with you and introduce to you. First of all, we will talk a little bit about the IHF Asia and Oceania Committee and uh, also the Asia and Oceania Strategic Planning Group. Uh, we will also have a look how ice hockey in Asia actually looks like from a coaching perspective, from an officiating perspective, and also from an event perspective. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will introduce you to our activities we had in this season, and we will also look ahead uh, to the coming season. So this map actually illustrates uh, the Asian region uh, very well, including Oceania. So when you just have a look now to the top left of this picture, here you see Europe, and what you can see right now are basically our 27 members from the, from the Asian and Oceania region. So it is quite uh, a lot of members. It is also quite um, a, a big area, so to say. And the main question is, and actually uh, was in the, in the past, how do we divide this region? Um, how do we develop this region? And how can we ensure that each of the member get the same attention? So. Uh, in fact, we were, that, we were then discussing that we need to have some kind of categories in a sense that uh, we, we combine the countries which somehow do have the same environment or starting point, uh, which is not always easy. And I would also say it is not perfect, but uh, actually we came up with about four categories. The first category would be the so-called self-standing countries. These are the countries with a longer history um, in ice hockey. And uh, also, these are countries who have certain programs already in place. Uh, for example, Australia, China, Japan, Kazakhstan, Korea, New Zealand, and DPR Korea. So the next, uh, the next category, uh, so to say, the Southeast Asian region countries with uh, Hong Kong, China, Indonesia, Macau, China, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Chinese Taipei. Then we have uh, another category, which we call the Northern Central countries. 
uh, in which we see somehow India, Kyrgyzstan, Lebanon, Mongolia, Nepal, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. And then we have also the Gulf region with uh, Iran, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. So these are the four, four categories right now. As I said, it's not really perfect, but uh, somehow it will enable us to work and provide targeted development uh, initiatives to these regions or to these countries. And at the same time, we can also better probably sell our sport to the region, to the sport authorities, and uh, also to the community. A few words about uh, the Asian and Oceania Committee, which is chaired by Chief Vice President uh, Ivar Somokhanov, uh, me being the secretary for this group. And uh, we have in total four committee members and two experts uh, coming from the United Arab Emirates with Mohamed Arif, Manchana Kasimson from Thailand, Hirosa Igusa from Japan, Harchinda Singh from India, and uh, with Shay Ganek from Australia and Arsenal Mergen, we have uh, two more experts which can cover and see this, uh, see the possibilities of the development activities for the region or where they actually live. And so now I would like to come back to the overview I presented to you before. Here we have uh, our seven self-standing countries. The next region would be probably then the Gulf region in which we also expect uh, two more members sooner or later coming from Bahrain or Saudi Arabia. Then we have the northern and central countries uh, with a new member probably coming up from Pakistan. And then we have the Southeast Asian region. So this is somehow with, uh, with what we work or with uh, how, we, how we apply our strategy. And I can also show you now the, uh, the allocation of our committee members and experts. So somehow we cover perfectly the whole region. Uh, from from various uh, perspectives. I have here now a short video which was taken in uh, 2011 in Mongolia. Actually, this video is recorded out from Mongolia. Uh, what I saw, how ISOK okay looked like 10 years ago. So if I remember right, uh, this video was taken uh, with a temperature of minus 30 degrees. So it was uh, really very cold, but it was at this time really amazing to see uh, how this ice hockey really started in Mongolia to grow. I mean, you saw, you saw the playing level, you saw also the different types of player playing on the ice, but you also saw a little bit the environment with the dashboards being made out of wood, the fence around, uh, which was at this time their the protective shielding. So this was the starting point when, uh, when I came here the very first time. And uh, when I prepared the presentation, uh, first of all, somehow it's always uh, easier to think about the towns or about this, the general situation in Asia. And uh, I will then show you also some other examples uh, which is basically totally contrary to what uh, to what I present right now. Coming back to the original discussion, that the variety of of the cultural differences, the possibilities to develop the sport, cannot be more different than we experience it uh, actually here right now. So generally speaking, we have uh, we have a fragile foundation, and uh, or we have uh, with new MNAs and new MNA structure. So it cannot be really compared uh, with uh, countries uh, in Europe or in North America. So it's okay, except uh, for these uh, self-standing countries, uh, which I presented before, is relatively new. 
We have also a big uh, geographical disadvantage and uh, with that also long distances. So the average flight uh, I calculated in the past, we, of course there are distances uh, where we have about 10 or 12 hours flights in between the countries, but uh, they are also very close uh, neighboring countries, so to say. But in average, the, uh, the, the distance uh, is about four hours uh, by plane. There is a lack of financial resources uh, making it very challenging for all our members uh, to develop the sport in every single area and aspect. We also know that ice hockey is not the sport number one in the region. Uh, generally speaking, we also see that other things come or need to come first, uh, meaning that the benefit of sport, for example, and what ice hockey brings is not really seen right from the beginning from side of the uh, of the sport entities from side of the parents. So this is also one one area we identified. Another thing would be that the English English language in general is uh, is not uh, as good as expected. So we see uh, because of that uh, delay in the application of our programs and activities. There's also a missing week and domestic uh, league structure. So the sportive level is not uh, is not as high as it should be, given the fact that ice hockey is relatively new for the most of the countries, or even not existing uh, on a certain level. And with that, uh, the members are not in the position to have the required uh, number of games, which make them domestically stronger. And with that, that, they are also getting better on the international level. And there's also the what I call the, the upside down philosophy uh, in Asia. Give you an example. So for, in, in China, uh, basketball was not really much played until uh, they had uh, one of the players playing in the NBA. And from that uh, moment on, uh, basketball was uh, very big in the news. It attracted a lot of people. Uh, just think about that 100 million uh, parents uh, see a Chinese player in the, in the professional league uh, in North America, and with that, the interest simply grows. So this is what, uh, what I call the upside-down philosophy. The question is, do we really need to have this, or are we also in the lucky position to have this, to have really the first, uh, the first uh, uh, natural-born Asian player in the, in the best leagues in, in the world? And there is also some more. Again, generally speaking, it's a it's an untapped uh, business market with uh, absolutely a huge potential in several aspects. From the Olympic Winter Games to no ice rinks at all, uh, you can find everything. So we will we are playing ice hockey in three or four thousand uh, meter sea level, for example, in India, or we have uh, we just recently had uh, with two Olympic Winter Games uh, a very big opportunity in the Asian region. Uh, the playing level can be more different. Uh, we also need to say that uh, COVID uh, hit the Asian region uh, X times stronger than compared to other MNAs. I mean, COVID affected, of course, everyone, but from the Asian and Oceania perspective, and given what I just uh, explained, uh, that the foundation is more weak than, than uh, strong, uh, it is uh, really hard to come back and to reach the level which we had uh, before before the pandemic uh, hits the world. The sport itself is mainly run by, by volunteers, uh, but this is not negative because uh, we are also seeing that uh, everybody is picking up relatively quick and also in a speed in certain areas uh, which we never have seen before. And uh, what, uh, what I also would like to, to bring to you, just think about, so these countries, they need to, Establish the sport ice hockey, which is relatively new for them, uh, in the in the Asia and Oceania region, where it is, in average, more warm than cold. And it would then be the same if you need to develop a sport in Europe, for example, badminton or let's say a camel race, uh, and make it sports number one. So this is also a, a big challenge for all of our members, but uh, definitely the region requires special attention and investment to make uh, ice hockey globally stronger. So this is the starting point. And when we when we somehow reflect what are the, the weakest points in the in the Asian and Oceania region, generally speaking, again, this does not apply for, for all the members, uh, but for a certain for a certain um, for a certain moment, uh, absolutely.
but and here's the but. Let me talk uh, first about uh, events. And uh, actually, we are uh, we are playing the Under 18 Asian and Oceania Championship in Ulaanbaatar, in Mongolia. And this is the picture you probably remember what I showed you at the beginning. Uh, so this picture was taken in 2011 here in Mongolia. And uh, actually, as we came here, we saw one of the most unbelievable transformations the country can experience from an ice hockey perspective. This picture was taken just two or three days ago, and uh, it was really absolutely unbelievable to see how the sport developed in this region or in this in this country actually. So the efforts which was put from many people and individuals into the sport, the attention which was given from side of the government uh, to make something new to provide uh, the right environment for the uh, for the players and especially also private investors who really want to contribute uh, to the sport is uh, is really unbelievable and uh, it's uh, i would say one of the uh, at the moment one of the the most inspiring stories we can we can have because mongolia started basically from from zero and it took almost one or probably two decades to come to this point to have right now this kind of arena in in mongolia Here's a little bit of uh, history of the Asian and Oceania Championships, uh, which I actually played. They were also called in the past IHF Challenge Cup of uh, Asia. This is more or less the first and at the same time the last step uh, for MNAs who will join the World Championship program in future. The same for the game officials. As you can see in this overview, the first tournament was played in 2008. It was uh, for the men's division. I think it was in, in Bangkok at some point. And uh, then, then more countries joined the, the IHF, uh, then more demand was basically to, pro to provide them also a platform on international level. At the same time, it was known that the domestic level needs to be developed. But uh, you can see that starting from 2010, uh, we had uh, tournaments in three different categories, in the men's, women's, and men's under 20 category, which was at the beginning also <clears throat> played uh, between the universities uh, from, uh, from China, Japan, and Korea. Then in 2004, let's say from 2014 to 2018, the, uh, the, the number of teams participating in this event reached a new all-time high. Uh, I remember the one of the of the tournaments, uh, which was played with a total of uh, eleven countries, uh, ten countries, sorry, in in Bangkok, and then from two thousand twenty to twenty twenty one, there was then the time of the pandemic. So this was the standstill everybody experienced uh, from us, and uh, in twenty twenty two, we started again at this time with the under twenty category. A total of eight teams were participating. Uh, in this season, we will have uh, the Women's Asia and Oceania Championship with a total of eight teams. And uh, we will also actually play the men's under 18 event with uh, six participating countries. So uh, these tournaments, they are played under IHF rules and regulations, including player eligibility. And from the organizational level, uh, it is more than only remarkable and it's getting even better. So the environment, uh, these countries, uh, provide uh, when we have these tournaments is uh, really remarkable. This is an overview about all of the 27 AOSPG members and in which you can see in which categories uh, actually they play in the IHF World Championship program. So the upper part of this graphical chart shows you the participation uh, of, the, of the countries in the men's category. So uh, in total, we have uh, 20 teams or 20 MNAs participating in this category, which is about 74% of the of the AOSPG members. In the women's category, senior, we do not have so many countries as we would like to have. Actually, it is uh, it is only about eight, which is 30% of the total total members uh, of the AOSPG group. In the men's under 20, men's under 18, and women's under 18, 
categories, it's a similar similar picture, and we also know that uh, that only countries play in this uh, in this category who have simply a longer history. But uh, when you look to the to the green chart uh, on this slide, uh, you can see also a, spe a special trend. And this chart uh, actually shows you the interest uh, of the countries or the need where they think they need to have also some kind of uh, international uh, competition to simply sell the product back home. So it is uh, for all of these countries, it is relatively hard uh, to explain to the government uh, that they require some funding when they do not play any international competition. So this is also one big challenge we are actually facing. And uh, what you can see here, that the demand for the men's under 18 category and also for the women's category is uh, simply increasing. And this is actually the reason why we have in this season under 18 and uh, women's, uh, women's Asia and Oceania Championship. What about officiating? So my colleague, Joel Hansen, officiating uh, development manager, explained already in the past uh, what we are doing. So he's also very active with, uh, with several programs. Uh, I will not go into detail, but I would like to share with you two special photos I found in the archive. This photo was uh, basically taken in 2011 when uh, one at this time Challenge Cup of Asia was played in Kuwait, and uh, from the from the participant or from the game officials you see here, uh, there is basically uh, one uh, one game official. Uh, for the very first time in the history of uh, of Asia, playing in 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 this uh, in this event, and when we then look to the next slide and photo, so this picture was taken uh, in the last under twenty Asia and Oceania Championship, and uh, you can see here basically only game of officials from the Asia and Oceania region. And going back to the original picture, the game official who participated here the very first time in an IHF competition coming out from a new IMA uh, from the from the IHF, he is now actually uh, involved as an officiating coach. And uh, so with that, we can really see that uh, many things are developing in the in a very positive direction. And uh, this is also a very positive moment uh, we can share here that uh, in the meantime for Asia and Oceania Championships, uh, we are in the position to assign game officials who come exclusively from the Asia and Oceania region. The following video shows you and will give you some impression about the under 18 event, which, we, which is happening right now in uh, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. <laughs> so the teams uh, which we are playing here were, were the teams from Mongolia and uh, Uzbekistan uh, in yesterday's event. Let me now uh, introduce a little bit into our activities uh, in regards of coaching programs. So coming back uh, basically to the more or less uh, weak foundation we, we had and the experience in the past, it is uh, our intention to uh, somehow revamp uh, the coaching program in cooperation with our countries, not only for Asia, but also for all other uh, IHF uh, members. Uh, but uh, for Asia and Oceania, we know that uh, first we really need to do our homework from the IHF side and also from the MA side. And uh, therefore, uh, we started uh, with the Learn to Play program. 
So learn to play program, even in, in Asia, sometimes it is nothing new, but uh, we simply uh, take the opportunity. And this is also part of the IHF new strategy, IS-26, that doesn't matter which playing level the countries have, they can either consolidate uh, their knowledge they have in many different areas, uh, countries can go or will be introduced into a new way of coaching. Countries who have already the experience, they can also reconfirm what they are doing. Or we as the IHF, we challenge ourselves and also our m and uh, in order to simply make the next step uh, from a development perspective. And the next video I would like to show to you is uh, coming from Bangkok, from Thailand, in which we organized the Learn to Play program just recently.
this program, what you just saw, was uh, held in Bangkok, and we had a similar activity and program right now in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were asking the countries to send their instructors uh, who should be in future responsible to drive the same learn to play program back home after the, the program successfully finished. We will have uh, with all the instructors who participated in this program, regular follow up sessions. Uh, we will also have a specific look what happens in each m &A because also from the IHF side, we want to ensure that the money which is uh, invested is also invested in the right way. Uh, so this brings me somehow to the question, what should come first? So an interesting question. I would say it's a good mix of events we need to have, but uh, also for certain development activities because our m as in which the foundation is relatively weak or just started new, they also need to sell somehow uh, that the development efforts to the sport entities or to the sport government. And without having or being part of international competition, this is uh, really hard uh, than if this does not uh, take place. So again, it should be a good mix with a main focus on development, coaching and officiating as a first step. And then we look simply further and see how we how we can develop uh, the region and also each m &A. These are our activities uh, which were held or which are currently going on or will be held in future in this season. Uh, from the officiating side, uh, we have the so-called AOSPG Referring Chief Network, which is uh, online and uh, which is held every every month for the duration of about one and a half hour. So we, we, we from, from our side, uh, we present different areas and what we think uh, the m &As need to know, but we also give and use this platform uh, for the referent chiefs of each m &A that they can discuss the current situation uh, about uh, the domestic situation. And we can then have uh, or give feedback what we think, how the, uh, how the situation can be improved towards a, a properly run officiating program. We will also have a referent chief summit uh, later on in this season. And uh, we also try to use uh, events which we organize in the best possible way. Uh, for example, at uh, both of our uh, Asian and Oceania Championships, we are working with uh, reference chiefs or officiating coaches from neighboring countries to, first of all, use the, the geographical, in this, in this case, uh, advantage. So because they are more closer uh, than compared to when we organize something for all of our members. And uh, with this, we really think that this was a very good starting point in the season to further develop officiating. Overall development activities were the ice management seminar, which was held back in October. We also organized and just concluded two learn to play programs, one in the East and one in the West Asia and Oceania region. We also will organize the uh, joint venture development camp hosted by the Olympic Council of Asia, in which we provide the required technical support to run such a development camp. We also put a, a big focus on our communication uh, with, uh, with the members. So we really want to get a sense and to know uh, what is the real situation in each country to somehow uh, provide uh, solutions and information but according to the needs. Uh, countries have uh, also done some kind of self-assessment and this is basically part uh, or this will, this, this will be basically used for our communication with, with our countries. And we also informed from side of the IHF development department about the m a developer program for which each m a actually received uh, the information. And we hope that this, uh, that this chance will be used not only from the Asian and Oceania countries, but also from all IHF, uh, from, from all IHF members. It is a new approach, and we are absolutely convinced that it is the right step to further develop ice hockey, uh, not only on a regional, but also on a, on a global scale. From the event perspective, we have uh, in this season two events. It is the Under-18 Asian Oceania Championship actually going on uh, in Mongolia. And uh, later on in April or beginning of May, we will have the Women's Asian Oceania Championship uh, in Bangkok, in Thailand. 
a little bit uh, of forecast what we plan for the coming season. First of all, uh, as for, for all activities from the IHF, we, we need to go through the, for the budget process and, uh, and the confirmation in that sense. Uh, what we know, of course, we need to have a good mix on, on development programs. So we will have uh, our one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with each of the MAs, which will last for about one or two days. Uh, we will also provide some coaching programs, officiating programs, and also a good mix on events. With uh, all of this, uh, we, we will have a look that we further, or that MAs can further consolidate uh, the, the current situation that probably newcomers or even even uh, uh, MNAs with uh, with uh, with more experience in ice hockey can go also new ways. They have then also the possibility to reconfirm on what they are doing, same as uh, new members. And we will challenge not only the MNAs but also us as IHF uh, that we can provide each MNA on a global scale with the tools they need to have to further develop uh, ISOK -okay, uh, globally. With that, I'm at the end of, uh, of my presentation. So uh, I would, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your attention. It took a little bit longer than expected. Uh, probably we will make also a second part of, of about the Asia and Oceania region. And with this, I would like to give back the floor to the IHF studio and Joel. Thank you.